T-minus 17, final guidance release. We'll expect engine ignition at 8.9 seconds. 10, 9, 8, 7, ignition sequence started. All engines are started. We have ignition. 2, 1, 0, we have a liftoff. gentlemen, welcome to the 2015 Amazon Web Services Worldwide Public Sector Breakfast. Please welcome to the stage, Trisha Davis Muffet, Head of Marketing. How are you? <laughs> I have to admit, last night when we looked at this big room, we thought, Really? At 7 in the morning? How's it going to be here? <laughs> we thought we might be here all by ourselves. But here you are. That's how we roll in public sector, right? <laughs> all right. So um, we are so glad to have you guys here. Um, we are looking at a great event. There will be more than 18,000 people here at reInvent, which is unbelievable. Be careful on the escalators. Um, <laughs> and we have almost 1,200 from public sector. And you can see who's coming, but we have representation really from every segment of our business from all around the world. We are so thrilled to have you all here today with us. And we have some great things going on in public sector. We've got a lot of content. It can be a little tough to find it because it's all sort of mixed into the general content. So I encourage all of you to download the app for the uh, event. If you have not done that yet, it's on all the signs, shows you how to download the app, and then look for all the sessions that are tagged public sector. But just giving you, these are some of the things that are here. I do want to highlight for you, today at 1.30 is an all-in panel. You'll hear from Andy a little bit later this morning about um, all of the customers who are really choosing to go all in with us. And I would really encourage you to go to that session if you can, because it's going to be a great one in all public sector customers. Um, we've also got a ton of things going on tomorrow. You can hear from almost any kind of customer you want in the public sector, people who are just like you. We've got a great session on GovCloud going on um, to talk about how that's relevant across the market. So please definitely check out those sessions. And then a few other things. So we do have some birds of a feather things. Those are actually filled with waiting lists right now at the education roundtable for people who want to get up again at 7 tomorrow. And um, I see luncheon tomorrow. <laughs> um, and, then, um, and then I do want to also turn your attention to the Women in Technology panel, which Teresa will be moderating at 4.15 tomorrow. So please check out those things. We really look forward to having you at all those events. And then most importantly, to wrap up, before you go to the big replay party tomorrow night, which I'm sure will have an amazing musical guest, um, we are having our own public sector party just for you guys. Um, this is our mascot, our little, our little uh, Operation Public Sector Spy Cloud. And um, we're having a spy-themed party at Tao Nightclub, 6.30 to 8.30. So we would love to have all of you there. Um, if you have not yet registered for the party, you can actually do that this morning. We have a registration table at the back. Some of you may have already picked up your wristbands. That'll help you just get right in tomorrow. Do please remember to bring your ID with you because it is a nightclub. They will check your ID. Lots of you look like you're under 21, so <laughs> we need to get everybody checked in. Um, okay, and 
so we have a fantastic breakfast set up for you this morning. Um, Teresa Carlson is going to come to the stage in just a few minutes, um, give you an update on what's going on in public sector. She has some announcements as well. And then we'll welcome Steve Schmidt, who's our Vice President and Chief Information Security Officer, since we know security is important to so many of you. Um, and then we have some fantastic customer speakers as well. Sue Gordon from the intelligence community, Nicole McNeil, who's got a great perspective as a CFO coming from the Canadian market, and then Jonathan Marks, who is really in a startup that's doing um, political open data work. So um, very interesting group of speakers for you this morning. So now, without further ado, please welcome Teresa Carlson. <laughs> believe this room. When I'm looking at this, my heart is like, wow. Uh, four years ago, who was here four years ago? How many? Okay. What about three years ago? Two years ago? Wow. It's amazing. And the, the fact that we even have public sector customers actually coming to Las Vegas. But the thing that I love the most... <laughs> Yeah, right? The thing I love the most, though, is the fact that you all come up to me and you say, I love your content. I love that this is a learning conference. There's so many things that we can do. We don't know where to begin. And that is our goal, to make this so rich and exciting for you that you want to come back every year. And every year, we're going to double and triple this room size. So thank you so much. And with that, I'll just say thank you. We would be nowhere in this space without your sponsorship, your support. Um, it, it really is amazing to see what you all are doing with Amazon Web Services and cloud computing. And it's just a testament to uh, what you're going to hear today from customers. So again, thank you for coming. We so appreciate you. And we really do continue to grow the business. Around the world, public sector continues to gain momentum within the space of, of education, government, not-for-profit, NGOs. This is sort of just a NASCAR slide of continuing to see, and this doesn't even scratch the surface to represent actually what we're doing in the public sector market. Additionally, I can't believe it, but we do have over 2,000 government agencies today around the world utilizing AWS, and those are only the ones I track in my data that Emily and I track. Uh, you all as partners, if you counted up all of the agencies, there would be a lot more. But this is sort of my tracking. I like data, and this is a way for me to say, are we growing? Are we, are we gaining momentum in this market? And this shows me that we actually are. Also, we have over 5,000 educational institutions, and we have over 17,500 not-for-profits. So really exciting business, growing very, very fast. And this just sort of gives you an example. And to put it into perspective, last year we announced that we had 900 government agencies. So just in a year, you can see what we've done. 3,400 educational institutions and 11,000 not-for-profits. So again, just in one year of my data and my tracking, it showcases how much we're actually growing. Also, um, how, many, how many of you are partners in here? Can you just give me a, wow, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you. I have a little cheat sheet up here because I couldn't exactly remember, but uh, Premier Consulting Partners. So just again, to put some of this in perspective of the type of growth that we're gaining, uh, almost five years ago when I started, we had one we had one partner, one. Today, fast forward, almost five years in the business, we have 6,500 partners in public sector. 6,500, is that not amazing? And of the 6,500 partners, we have 150 of those that are premier and advanced consulting partners, right? I mean, pretty cool. That means that they're moving up, gaining skills, gaining momentum, so we're really driving in the market, and uh, I think that just showcases the amount of work and opportunity there, that there actually is. So thank you to all the premier uh, partners. Also, ISVs. The ISV community continues to grow, SaaS providers, tech partners. Again, today, we have over 2,200, and that is growing. 
We spend a lot of our time actually with ISVs and SaaS providers. Now we have Marketplace, we continue to grow and add more and more partners in this program. Government authorized resellers. Another way that I can really say, what's the indicators for the business? How is it growing? Well, in 2011, max, remember we had eight. Today, amazing, we have over 150 government authorized resellers. Wow. And I love that because this is a really, this is a special program we set up just for our government resellers, so it shows that it's actually working. Now, what's the other indicator that we are moving in the right direction? Cloud-friendly procurements, my favorite thing. I love cloud-friendly procurements. This shows that our customers actually have a way to buy the service. And I can tell you those dots were pretty small three years ago and four years ago. And all of a sudden this year, we have had an explosion of cloud-friendly procurements and wins. In fact, I'll tell you a little secret. Inside my team, my bid proposal and capture team, we have um, a daily little email that comes out if we win, if we, if we have a win. It comes, through our, it comes through our sales force and we say, it, it comes out and it says we have a win in cloud and the partner is and here's what we're doing and we celebrate. And I can tell you every day almost we have a celebration. Sometimes we have a celebration two and three times a day. And the reason we celebrate, because this shows me that the industry is moving in the right direction for cloud. That we actually have our customers around the world that are writing cloud-friendly contracts that are gaining momentum. It is so exciting, you guys. I mean, really. And that is not us, that is you all doing this. The customers are putting these procurements together and our partners are bidding them. And when they come in, it's not AWS Direct. These are with partners. Um, I just talked to Blue Canopy a while ago. Where's Blue Canopy? I'll call them out. And we just won a $12 million deal. Theirs is bigger with the SEC. Huge. And we were just talking about how fun and exciting it was to bid that and work that together. And I could call out many of you guys here in this audience today. But that's really us working together, and the agencies and organizations are really understanding how they put these procurements together. So I'm not going to go into all of these because these are just a few that we're seeing, but I thought you might enjoy this. And they're global. They're global. They're not just U.S., they're global. All right, who cares? Why does anyone really care about technology and cloud? Well, you all have heard me say, because I know most of you have been with me since the beginning as we've grown this business, that we talked about two things, paving the way for disruptive innovation in the public sector space, which is really needed, but also making the world a better place. And those two things go together really well, I think, with our mission. And that is the reason I believe that we are in lockstep with our customers. Today, what I wanted to focus on just a little bit deeper was making the world a better place through technology in two areas. Enabling the citizens and students to innovate but also driving economic development. Because around the world, we see more and more that cloud is a mover around these two areas. One is, how do you take technology and make sure that you put it in the hands of citizens or make sure that citizens have the capabilities for themselves, as well as driving the economic um, development indicators. So as we do that, where's the team been? Well, this is just a little showcase of where the teams have been around the world evangelizing. It's a lot of fun. I'm looking at Mark Rowland over here who's been everywhere this year, I think. Mark's like, Teresa, I'm going to Chile. I'm going here. I'm going there. I'm like, okay, let's go. Let's do it. Let's do this. Let's drive this. Let's send this message. Let's make sure that we're growing the business in the right way. Notice I put Texas on here. It's really big, and I've spent a lot of time in Texas this year. <laughs> it sounds like we have some people from Texas out there. Um, this is a program near and dear to my team's heart, uh, which is we are announcing our second annual City on the Cloud Innovation Challenge. Last year, T Tricia was ready to kill me, but I said, we have got to do a City on a Cloud Challenge. We have got to showcase that cities are the next big hub of innovation. Because today, cities don't need to build big data centers anymore. They can take advantage of technology in a way that's really driving forward the model for innovation. 
So we have three categories, best practices, partners in innovation, and dream big. And the best practices category is actually about um, both cities themselves or companies that have created a solution that's actively being used in a city. And we're evaluating that. And the idea is if it's really good, we can get the word out there so other cities can take advantage of it. The second one is the partners in innovation. The partners in innovation is about uh, solutions that have been used minimally, but when we looked at them, we thought that there was an opportunity for them to be used in a much greater way on a global basis. The third one, which I think is really cool, provides an opportunity for young companies who have a dream big idea to showcase it and let Amazon Web Services actually get their name out there. So they have an idea. The idea has not been implemented yet, but this is a way we're going to take a look at these companies and then say, we think this is a really great dream big idea that cities should be using. So I'll quickly run through these. In our best practices award category, and we're going to announce the winners on November 11th in New York, but our best practices category, which by the way, this one was too US centric. So I said next year we have to have more international companies. But City of Los Angeles for their work at LAX, the County of Chester in Pennsylvania, Douglas County in Nebraska, Geospatial Modeling System, King County, Louisville Metro Data Initiatives in Kentucky, and South Central Planning and Development Commission in Louisiana. Our Partners in Innovation Award category finalists are Axon Group in Columbia. This one was much more international, which was nice. Civic Resource Group in the US, CDSM Interactive in the UK, Data Cats in Canada, gev to go in the US, Green Owl Mobile in Canada, Group XO in Colombia, India Compute Interchange in India, Municity 5 in the US, Open Tree Map in the US, My Permit Now in the US, Objective Arts in the US, Opportunity Space in the US, Park Smart in Italy, Quicket Solutions in the US, Seamless Docks in the US, Tribloom in the US, Wheelies, I love that, Wheelies in France, ViewScan in uh, Panama, and Visalanix Viz Technology in the US. And also in the Dream Big category, we have uh, Atelier at Tomorrow in Sweden, Bridge in the US, City of Houston in Texas, there you go, City of Marquette in Michigan, My H2 in the US, Open Grid in the City of Chicago, and Truver in France. So let's give these finalists, please, a big round of applause. And again, if you want to know more about these, you can go up to our website at aws.amazon.com, state and local government slash city on the cloud, and join us if you can in New York for the Best of New York Awards, and we'll be announcing that. I think a lot of them have already gone out and made their own press announcements, so very exciting about this. Now, what could hold us back from cloud? Well, one of the things that we definitely find, and it's one thing around the world I hear continually, is skills, job skills. I hear it in every agency, every organization. We need job skills, they say. We have jobs and we don't have enough people who understand and are developers and understand the DevOps model. And we know jobs are being created. We already know that. We look at all the startups, and these are just a couple examples where this year alone, 14 million jobs will be created. But McKinsey says, and many others, there's a big skill gap. And we see it. Our customers see it. So what are we doing about this? A fantastic program that we launched in May is called AWS Educate. I don't know if you saw this when it came out, but I wanted to give you some of the results because if you were at our symposium in June, we talked about it then, that it's a global program to really make lifelong learners a cloud and really teach them at both the elementary and university level about cloud computing in a real, uh, in, a, in a way that makes them have the skills and go out and get the job, earn, earn the certificate and degree, and it has four elements to it, credits, training, content, and collaboration. And the, I think the best two parts about this, believe it or not, are content and collaboration. Professors are sharing the content. There's a portal that they put the content in. So professors or groups around the world share it and collaborate and crowdsource and give each other feedback. And our AWS Educate team gives those professors feedback and guidance, and we support them doing codeathons, hackathons, we get into the university, and we're doing hashtag smart is beautiful. We're helping set up girls 
and young women's coding groups. And by the way, if you notice on your table, you have new stickers that say hashtag smart is beautiful. And I hope everyone will take it and proudly put that on your computer, give it to your daughters, someone you know, and get them really excited about it. What's going on with the adoption of this? I wanted to share, so just since May, and really it was, we, we, we announced it in May, we got it really going in June, and the students, a lot of the students really came back to college around August. So we've had phenomenal results already, and this is a program everybody loves. We already have 350 institutions signed up, 1,200 professors. I love the professors because that means content's being created. 7,500 students and 50% are outside the U.S. So we continue to do translation and drive this program globally. And I keep saying to the team, I want more, sign up more, we need more involved. But I was just spending time with the U.S. Department of Defense CIOs about two months ago, and I briefed this program. And believe it or not, they wanted to spend almost 50% of their time talking about this program. Because they said in Department of Defense, one of the things they really lack are skills, new skills. And they were really excited. They said, can we roll this program out in DOD? What are professors saying? I'll just give you the tagline here. Basically, professors are saying, this is working. It's giving us the skills we really need to help these students go out and um, have a career in technology. Real world skills, real world. And this is, this is what we want. We want them to have hands-on skills that they really can go and start working even in college and then continue to add on to those skills uh, for higher degree capabilities. So I told you, Smart is Beautiful. I'll just give you a quick update on that. Um, we talked about this at the panel last year, and this goal is really simple. It's about taking charge of our destiny to get more women in technology and not complaining about it. I hear a lot of complaints, blah, blah, blah. Well, let's do something about it. And this is a really simple little thing. It's not, it's not, that, it's not a lot, but it's basically you as an individual, and we'll take men and women, we're recruiting everyone, uh, say to yourself, I can help one young girl, a classroom, a program, I can set up something, I can set up my own circle. So this is really about helping um, groups facilitate how they bring young women together to get them excited about technology and computer science, but to keep their heads wrapped around that. Because one of the issues that we find is that uh, we get them into tech and then they leave. But if we start younger and get them really excited, and get them doing amazing things, and I think they'll stay. And I'll just give you a really quick example. Um, I was in Brussels uh, recently, and I went, these two amazing women started a coding club. And the, the way they got the young girls there, ages 7 to 16, is they told them they were going to create fashion. So they brought them in, they have this cute little, this little club, they bring them in, and they actually let them create fashion by coding. So they've taught them coding through creating fashion. So think about that. If it gets them involved and they find a way to, um, to sustain that interest in computer science, then let's make it happen. On the far right on the bottom is Georgetown University. They have a girls coding club. Uh, left are women I met with in Columbia that were awesome and they're creating a circle in Latin America and we've got two partners that are sponsoring them. Um, I was at the State Department where we had a Fortune Women's Forum on tech. And then my young little Madison, who's so cute, seven, I had her on stage. She's so smart and she's so beautiful and she loves tech. And uh, her father just reported that she's more enthusiastic than ever after being on stage with 3,500 people. She's talking about her career in tech. I said, awesome. <laughs> All right, quickly, let's talk about a few innovation programs that we're doing for public sector. And I'm going to get through these fast because I want to bring Steve Schmidt on because I know you really want to hear about security. Uh, there's a program that we have called the Open Data Program, and I just wanted to give you a quick update on this. There's three really interesting data sets that we've just launched. And why is this important? This is important because we are opening up the world of data so it can be used, crowdsourced on, shared, because one of the issues with data was that there wasn't enough capability or storage to share it. It would be sitting in someone's data center, but it wasn't being opened up to take advantage of. Three, we, we announced Landsat this year on AWS, and it's being crowdsourced by thousands already and utilized. 
We just announced our 3,000 rice genome data set, which I'm very excited about because what I found out through this is that over 20% of the calories in the world are consumed by rice. So we don't want to lose rice. That's an important part of uh, many diets around the world. And then also next generation radar from NOAA, that's another data set we just launched. So this is just giving you an idea of what we're trying to do to open up the market for our public sector customers and the world to take advantage of the amazing data by unlocking it. Because if you think about it, in the past, you had to store multiple copies over and over, and you really couldn't take advantage of what others were doing around the analytics. Now you can share those analytics in a way that increases your ability and speed to research. Also, uh, the others, some of the other areas that are sort of exci uh, exciting for us is just science in the cloud. What are we doing around science? Again, with genomic research, uh, with CERN, Chili's, and Aquaria. I mean, genomic from uh, hydrogen images. Just amazing things that you can do with the use of cloud. And you can dig into these. These are all housed on Amazon Web Services under our open data program. But we want to continue to get the most curated data sets in the world on Amazon Web Services so you all can take advantage of those. Now, the path to reinvention. You all have seen this before. But what I, what I wanted to share is, um, what is what happens when countries around the world adopt cloud? How do they adopt cloud? And what's the model by which they adopt it? And this is really important because I need your help to ensure that we're all evangelizing and moving this forward faster. Because all these parts and pieces and elements are really critical to our worldwide adoption of cloud computing. And what we found is you have to define cloud. People are now beginning to understand what is actually cloud computing. Definition was important, but policy is becoming even more important. And I had policy in the early days, but what I'm seeing now, something I'd just sort of like to talk about for a moment, is policy ends up inserting itself at each level here, each level. So we really have to be vigilant to make sure that when we talk about security and compliance, the policy piece is really thought through, and we're helping support that. Same with acquisition, same in the skills, and with just adoption. But really, um, these elements have to be in place for true adoption, though. Otherwise, you'll have people, naysayers, blockers that pop up. These are the important elements of cloud adoption. And you have to be watching for them at every step of the way, and you have to be in front of them, or we know they block us. But we're not going to allow ourselves to be blocked. We just have to be aware of the elements of, the, of what the blockers could be. So security and compliance, you're going, to get the, you're going to get the big dog here on stage in a minute to talk about security and compliance, but here's what I wanted to share. We launched U.S. GovCloud in 2011, and in the beginning, GovCloud was a U.S.-based, highly compliant, ITAR-only cloud. The only ITAR cloud is still the only ITAR cloud, but our customers really didn't know how to use it or take advantage of it. That has changed, and you can see our adoption in GovCloud has just been absolutely spectacular, 273% average year-over-year -year growth. And I tell everybody, I didn't really know in the early days how this would shape up, but the reason it shaped up is we, because we were early into this market, and we showed a commitment to our customer that we were, we were willing to put money up, funds up, and resources up to make sure you knew that we were serious about uh, cloud in the public sector space. Uh, also, what does that mean? Well, there's multiple regulatory and compliant features. So GovCloud is not just for the government itself, but it's for those highly regulated workloads. U.S. persons, ITAR, HIPAA, FIPS. The other thing is CGIS. We just launched CGIS. And this is just a quick slide of the types of services, because some of you say to me, well, Teresa, your services aren't as fast in GovCloud. Well, they're not going to be because it's a U.S. person's, it's highly regulated, we monitor and manage who's in that cloud. So, but we listen to you very closely on the services you say you want and we launch them based on the pipeline. So if you tell us you want that service, we'll get it in there and our, I think our roadmap is actually really robust for it uh, moving forward as well. AWS overall, um, really proud of the fact that we took a leadership role in security and compliance. 
We are the most secure and compliant cloud in the world by far. We said in the early days, if we cannot just meet, we have to exceed security and compliance requirements. And I think that we have demonstrated over and over we are very serious about this, very serious. If there is a, uh, is the, if there is a compliant regime out there, a security regime, we step up, we work with our customers, and we also, by the way, help shape these. I can tell you right now, many of these, we work directly with the organization to help shape how they're thinking. And FedRAMP today is used by as many commercial enterprises as it is by government enterprises, believe it or not, because there's no real cloud security model out there today. So actually, enterprises, I talked to a lot of enterprises that are like, FedRAMP's the best thing out there. It has the right controls. So the newest is Sieges. I put this up here because there was some big misnomer out there that Amazon Web Services did not support Sieges. So I want to set the record straight. Right now, we absolutely support Sieges. It is a criminal justice information program that is written by the Federal Bureau of Investigation, and it applies to all criminal justice information out there. And the reason I love this is because this is applicable around the world. It may not be called Sieges in other parts of the world, but we'll continue to add those logos as well. But very excited about Sieges. And if you want to uh, talk to anybody, Frank's here in the audience. He runs our state and local business, so please talk to him. And now I'd like to bring to the stage Steve Schmidt, who is our CISO and Vice President of Security and Technology. Thank you, Thank you Steve. Thank you. Thank you, Teresa, and good morning, everyone. Uh, had a, a sort of an interesting um, revelation to myself in the elevator on the way up here. And I think um, I'm going to cause the marketing folks to have a little bit of a heart attack because I'm not going to use my slides. Uh, I wanted instead to sort of chat with you about a, a very personal experience that I had. And um, it's principally related to the fact that I used to be in your seats. Uh, eight years ago, and by the way, eight years in Amazon terms makes me about a thousand years old. But eight years ago, I was at the FBI where I was responsible for an organization that built intelligence analysis platforms. And we had a technology problem, and the technology problem was the fact that we kept expanding so fast, the file systems we built couldn't keep up with it. So the basic problem we had was that we took in a bunch of information from a variety of places. We have to manipulate it some, tear it apart, compare it to stuff we already had. Well, you need the, the decomposable components that you would expect in that circumstance. Compute, storage, database, queues, triggering systems, et cetera. And we built those internally with our staff. But the problem was our workload was doing this. And the other half of that problem, of course, is that our budgets were doing this. And so we had to find a better way to manage that particular issue. And Amazon had just come out with this thing called Amazon S3, which many people were like, what? What is an object store? I don't understand this thing but it was perfect for what we needed. We needed to be able to put a, a blob of data into a store, and then when we needed it back, ask for it using a URL, rather than trying to find it in a file system, et cetera. And so we approached Amazon and said, hey, could you build this for us, please? We could really, really use it. And the answer from Amazon was a conversation, and it turned into, hey, would you like to come build these things rather than be a consumer of them? A what? And so a bunch of us said, yeah, sure, this, this sounds like a really fun deal. And we moved into Amazon and started building the components that are now virtual private cloud. So a group from the, pro the public sector moved into a crazy fast technology company and built the underpinnings that run the entire AWS cloud right now. So we own VPC and we built it. And people don't realize how influential the requirements of the public sector are. Literally, the reason we built VPC was because of the security requirements that this customer set has. And that was something that sort of shocked me as, wow, this was really a seminal event in, in the ability of AWS to support protected workloads. Eight years later, of course, we're happy to have the US intelligence community say, yep, you guys are appropriate for our use. 
And it gets me to the point where now we look at all of the new features that we add every year for security and how they all tie back to the, the very fundamental components that you guys are asking for. So this year we launched about 187 new features that are security or identity related, up from about 140-ish last year. And it's an area that we continue to invest. If you look at the, the features that we have, it gives you the ability to have incredibly fine-grained access control. It gives you the ability to have very, very ubiquitous encryption across the infrastructure, to push down key management systems to all the systems that need to consume those cryptographic keys, but do them at a velocity that supports the AWS scale, and do them at a durability and availability that you expect as customers. And when you look at that and come back with what are the decomposable parts that we offer now as a platform, I could build that entire system that I had at the FBI using the pieces that are in AWS right now. As an exercise, we did. And the irony was a, a system that took us a whole lot of people to build in prior years and an enormous amount of money as a taxpayer, it makes me hurt. We now built with four folks in three weeks and spent about 80 bucks. And the answer there is, the, the thing that was really liberating for me as a result of that was the fact that you can react rapidly to changing demands in your environment. You know, we built that system because it was the only way to get at the information we needed to do our job to help protect our country. I now do the same thing within this organization to protect our customers. So we tear apart the information that we get about the bad guys, what they're doing, what's going on in our systems, et cetera, using the same theories that we used previously to identify the terrorists and identify the hackers. Now the great news is that the access to that technology is not limited to my team. We use the exact same platform that you guys use. So every morning, for example, my team runs Hadoop jobs across all of our access logs in our infrastructure so that I can understand with precision what all of our people are doing when they're in contact with your information. So I literally get an email every morning that tells me on the EC2 infrastructure exactly what every Amazonian did when they executed a privileged command. So I know who touched what data, for what purpose, when, and what the result was. Now, when I talk to CISOs in, our comp in their uh, customer organizations, and you say, you know, what's the visibility that you have into what's going on with your data and your infrastructure? It's often not what they'd like. And fundamentally, that's because there's a lack of visibility. And I think the number one thing that you get when you move into an API-driven infrastructure like AWS is visibility. Because there's no way to plug something in under a desk, there's no way to leave something in a server room and somebody left and nobody knows why it's there. And of course, by the way, they're always afraid to unplug it because you never know what's gonna break. Because everything's recorded, you can see exactly what's going on. And you can see precisely who took what action and you can decide, is that right for my business? And with that visibility then, of course, there's auditability. You can prove to the regulators who oversee you the congressional committee who wants to understand what's going on. Who's doing what with that information? And most importantly, from a security professional standpoint, I can control things. I can control exactly who has access to what data from where, when, and how. And that puts me in a tremendously liberated position. When you hear Andy Jassy talk today in his keynote, he's gonna focus on a lot of different new features out there but he's gonna spend, given the audience, an amazing amount of time on security features, which we're really proud of. And one of the things that we did was, again, extending the public sector model into the private sector. The idea of continuous monitoring and continuous compliance is not something that's very uh, popular, really, in the private sector, but it's something, of course, the government focuses a lot on. And so we built a new service that Andy's gonna talk about today that helps us internally do continuous evaluation of our security posture for all of our systems. And we're gonna be happy to announce it to folks later on today as we roll it out to everybody at AWS. Uh, I own the application security team. We do our evaluations of all our services. 
uh, in terms of how are they built, uh, what kind of crypto they use, how do they manage keys, um, how do we process various kinds of data. We took that knowledge, packaged it up into a service, and we're making it available now to customers. Um, so you'll hear more about that later on today. So to get back to my story originally, um, when I got an opportunity to, to talk to you folks, I wanted to say, I think the thing that you underestimate the most is the influence that you have on the technology business as a whole across the planet. Now, Teresa pointed out that many, many companies are using FedRAMP now as a proxy for appropriate operations because it describes controls that represent an amalgam of what people believe to be the right way to control data. And we've been FedRAMP compliant with our infrastructure for a long time. We're very proud of that. There's an enormous amount of work that goes into it. And the cool thing is now that that's applicable to much, much more than the people in this room. So I want to thank you for your influence and the way you're raising the bar for security across the internet. And with that, I hope you have a great day. Please enjoy reInvent. Thank you so much, Steve. So now we're going to hear from Sue Gordon, who um, is one of those people, just like what Steve was talking about, a true innovator from inside the government. Um, Sue is the deputy director of the National Geospatial Intelligence Agency. She took on that role this year after a 25-year career at the CIA, where she was working on cyber threats and, um, and really has, has done a, a huge job in moving forward our ability to cope with the threats to our information uh, security. So please welcome Sue Gordon to talk about more mission for the money. Great. Wow, good morning. How are you? Um, I know so many friends in this room, and there's data in that. Um, I'm so happy to be here. I also have been told that it works best if I stay in these two squares, which feels a little like a coaching box to me, but I'll give it a run. Um, NGA delivers world-class geospatial intelligence and provides decision advantage for policymakers, warfighters, and intelligence professionals. I say it differently. I say that we provide the content and the context so the nation can know the truth, see beyond the horizon, and be able to act before events dictate. Sure, I'm talking about spy satellites, but in 2015, if we're going to fulfill our promise to know the Earth, show the way, understand the world, we're going to have to bring a lot more to the table. And that's why I'm here talking to you. So we're in our 20th year, and our mission is as vital as ever. There is absolutely nothing about what I said that isn't valid today. But the conditions in which we must execute that mission have changed remarkably. So I'm going to try and tell a story that shows. For most of our history, the intelligence community has been like a sturdy, strong, albeit somewhat isolated house on the prairie. We collected data and we store it securely in stovepipes. We dealt with issues that were pretty constant. Our customers were a very specific set, and though we communicated with each other, it tended to be point to point and in a very secure manner. But something happened around 9-11. And if I were to steal the phrase from that noted biz business guru, Charles, Charles Obang, something happened after midnight. <laughs> and the world changed. And when we woke up, everything was different. It was dynamic. It was complex. It was nearly chaotic. Data is exploding around us and runs the risk of overwhelming us just at the moment that we went, when we must, must know so much more. And the issues, they sound the same. Russia, China, regional conflict, counterterrorism. And yet, are they the same? And what about cyber? 
In fact, our customers and their nature and their needs have changed as well. And if we're going to be good, we have to meet them where they are on this landscape, not that relatively quiet landscape. <laughs> What's most vexing to us at NGA is that even the most fundamental of our crafts, geography, requires new thinking. Borders, absolutely. It's a great way to understand what we see. Well, let's think about that today. There is so much more going on beyond that. There are cultural interactions, tribal relationships, digital networks, all of which are micro-trends that must be understood if we are to be able to put what we see in the context of what somebody needs to know. It's the reason why national issues become international space. China and Russia look the same. They're not the same. The Mideast has the same borders that we saw in the atlases that we used in college. And yet, entities like ISIL are advancing and operating in ways that are difficult to see from a photograph from above. Simply put, what got us here won't get us there. Now, I just went to Maui. I didn't take a vacation because it was too overwhelming. If you hang with me, it'll make sense. And I visited the top of Haleakala Crater, and what I saw in that pre-dawn sky were breathtaking stars. But more, you know what this steely-eyed intelligence professional saw? I saw satellites. Lots of them. I remember 20 years ago, you could crane your eye head to the sky forever and not see one, and I just looked, and they were all over the place. Our satellites, international partner satellites, commercial satellites, thank you, Digital Globe, for your wonderful mission partnership. And you know what else is coming? The small sat revolution. 20 years from now, this sky that I thought was full, full of satellites is going to be even more so. Why do I care? because they are going to produce content that I can use to fill in the gaps in knowledge that I need. Now let's talk about using data. NGA, in late 2014 and early 2015, played a behind-the-scenes role in uh, addressing the Ebola crisis. And what we did was we took a vast amount of our data and we made it available for public use. Not with a cat card, not on a secure network, but on the World Wide Web. And what it allowed was medics and international workers to be able to locate and stem the outbreak because we made our data available. And this year, we've added data on the Nepal earthquake and on the Arctic. And if you visited nga.mil right now, okay, don't do it right now because I want you to listen to me. <laughs> but when you visit nga.mil, you'll see those data sets and more. If you ch click on GWINT services, you know what you're going to find? You're going to find source code and applications that you can use not only on our data, but on your data. And all of this is key to what we believe we must do, not because we're the cool kids, but because that's where the issues, data, people, and customers are. We must succeed in the open. This is where you come in. Our partners are in the open. You bring to us the technology that we need. You have brought to us the infrastructure by way of the cloud that we are going to use in ways that we can only imagine. We've invested in the infrastructure, now we're going to put it to a test. But it's no easy day when you work for the government because we can't just pursue things blindly with happiness about what it offers. Because we're the government, we have to be sure. And it's always a matter of balance. A balance between speed and accuracy. A balance between crowdsourced and pedigree, a balance between national security and civil liberties, a balance between unclassified and classified. Join us, no easy day. Here's what I'll tell you. I, have, I believe that we have a moment for magic. I've laid out a compelling mission, a sure need, seemingly insurmountable obstacles, incredible opportunity, now my work is almost done, and our work begins. 
I need you to join us if you are an employee, an industry partner, an academic. If you're a subject matter expert, if you're a concerned citizen, join us. Because I need all of us in order for us to be able to know the earth, show the way, and understand the world. With the help of partners like AWS, I cannot wait to see what we do and come back next year and talk about it. Thank you very much. All right, so next up, we have a fantastic speaker. Um, let's click for it, sorry. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> Take a look at the, that globe up there. <laughs> so something completely different. So um, our next speaker comes to us from our largest Canadian customer. Nicole McNeil is the CFO and VP of Corporate Services at the Municipal Property Assessment Corporation. And they are um, collecting a huge amount of property uh, taxes and assessments. They do $2.2 trillion in property assessments and collect 20 to 30 billion in taxes generated for their municipalities. So um, she's got the financial story. So please welcome Nicole. Good morning, everyone, and thank you, Tricia, for that introduction. Let me start by asking you all this question. Raise your hand if you feel you've ever been given the impossible challenge. <laughs> I know most of us in this room have. Well, I'm here today to share our story with you, one where we had to cut our business cycle in half. We had no budget dollars allocated for us to do this. And we were in uncharted waters we had no history or proven techniques internally to pull from. And as you can see from the title of my presentation, we did it because we had no choice. So as Tricia mentioned, I'm the Chief Financial Officer and I also have the accountability for IT. MPAC, or the Municipal Property Assessment Corporation, is a Canadian public sector organization. And our mandate is to deliver a province-wide property assessment system. We value over 5 million properties, worth over $2 trillion, and that generates almost $30 billion of tax revenue annually. And we are one of the largest assessment jurisdictions in the world. And back in 2013, we launched a new strategic plan, one that was brave with bold reaching goals. And a key insight to that plan was a report from a noted Canadian economist named Don Drummond. And he said, we need to reform Ontario's public services. We need to do more with less. We need to drive efficiency and effectiveness, two goals that complement each other. So at MPAC, we challenged ourselves to not only drive better public service, but to save over $20 million in the process. And we only gave ourselves four years to do it, with a dry run in the third year. So now let me share some of our IT landscape. <laughs> My IT department is about 160 staff and a $30 million budget. And we were paralyzed at times by lights on and care and feeding of our existing infrastructure. We were only 5% innovation and 95% run and build. And there was this fear of failure and desire for 100% certainty that was almost driving an anti-culture for change. Our systems either worked or predictably didn't work, and the organization had evolved around it, similar to how a tree grows through an intruding object. So a lot of our greatest challenges and greatest opportunities were often left unsolved. Innovation and evolution through cloud became more and more obvious and necessary for our own survival. So this prompted our first experiment. We had to improve our customer-facing portal for over 5 million property owners in Ontario. And it all started with a handful of people in IT 
who set up an AWS account on a purchasing card at an average of $50 to $100 a month. <laughs> and their belief was, we think we can do this faster and better than we ever have before. And the architecture was open source, cloud, integrate, not build, privacy and security. And the results, within only three months, we had achieved over 75% savings. We had over 200,000 user accounts, almost two million inquiries, and we'd implemented a privacy by design framework. It was a success. And based on that success, we made an executive level commitment to the cloud, and we started on our journey of 100% cloud, zero owned infrastructure on demand, and dramatically lower IT costs. Now with that success under our belt, here is our next challenge. This is where we essentially needed to cut our business cycle in half. We had multiple valuation platforms and our data was decentralized from Oracle to Excel to Clipper to MS Access. And we had painful system performance at times. It was taking us 40 hours to value 80,000 properties and we needed to get to four hours to value all five million. So therefore, we set out on a quest to achieve what we call one version of the truth, and this is how we did it. It started with us needing one data warehouse for data integrity and to enhance speed, and for this we utilized Amazon Redshift. We needed one service-enabled valuation engine, and for this we utilized open source components such as R and Python running on EC2. We needed to meet our privacy statutes, and AWS was approved for us in this regard by both our legal counsel and our internal privacy commissioner. And to monitor speed and performance, we used CloudWatch, ELB, and CloudScale. And the results? Millions of lines of code that used to be in stored procedures became thousands of lines of code in R. Cloud versus servers, instances were set up in seconds. And we now do continuous versioning with automated data checks. Now here's one of the first morals of the story that I'd like to share with you. It is the responsibility of leadership to encourage experimentation and embrace failure. Encourage your people to dream big and experiment. As the CFO and as part of the executive team, along with our president and our board, we've worked very hard through our strategic journey to build a culture that allows for bold, brave goals, new ideas, experimentation, and encouraging us to learn from failure. This was the start of our cloud journey at MPAC. Remember that small group in IT with a big idea and a purchasing card? From there, that small team redesigned and replatformed just one application. And here's another takeaway I'd like to leave with you. Cut the time out of your projects. We make all of our projects time bound, 100 days only. And in IT, that forced us to spend less time on build and run. And AWS was key for us in this regard. It took the work out of running IT and it allowed us to consume services instead. AWS essentially enabled us to become a business value IT department. And I'm proud to say that for our next core delivery, 100% of our core business engine will be running in AWS. It now runs 5,000% faster at one-tenth of the cost. And finally, scarcity forced us to innovate. Therefore, cut your IT budgets first. I thought you'd like that one. <laughs> we demanded innovation at dramatically less cost. This is what drove and necessitated cloud innovation at MPAC. RDS and Redshift have allowed us to eliminate licenses and essentially bring down our IT overhead. But we're not done. Our imagination continues to grow. So if you only remember these three things from my short talk, please remember this. Encourage experimentation. Cut the time out of your projects. And cut your budgets. We did. And we did it because we had no choice. Thank you, everyone. <laughs>
Thank you so much. All right, last but not least, um, we're going to welcome Jonathan Marks to the stage. He's the co-founder of Quorum, an online legislative platform that has been called the Moneyball Effect on K Street. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. My name is Jonathan Marks, and I'm the technical co-founder of Quorum, as she said, an online legislative strategy platform that provides unique quantitative insights into the US Congress. Two years ago, when my co-founder and I got started on working on this project, I was a complete political outsider. My very politi political insider co-founder teased me because I couldn't pronounce the names of the senators correctly. What I knew about politics came pretty much from the New York Times, and I had no idea how the system worked. But I knew one thing. As a political outsider, I was frustrated with politics and with Congress because it didn't seem like anything was working. Little did I know, but many members of Congress, many members of the advocacy community, and many real political insiders felt the same thing because politics in Washington is conducted right now without the benefit of using modern technology and big data. Interns go through and compare different versions of bills by hand. Even senior partners have to go through at times and try and tabulate vote results by hand, trying to figure out trends or attempting to figure out which members of Congress most, most care about their issues. It's a mess. It requires a huge amount of time and effort to find real insights into what is going on. And so two years ago, we set out to try and solve this problem. And what did we do? Well, because we are a cloud-first, AWS-based bootstrap startup, we were able to leverage a huge amount of computational power right from the outset. We first needed to find all of the information, because right now, there's no central API to access legislative information, either at the federal level or at the state level. There's no ability to go through and search all of the different press releases from different members of Congress or try to find what people are saying on the floor or in committee hearings. And so the first thing we did is we built the world's most comprehensive database of legislative information. Every bill, vote, amendment, press release, floor statement, tweet, Facebook post, dear colleague letter, and more, and put it all into a centrally managed, easily searchable and accessible database. We then proceeded to build a quantitative analytics layer on top of all these data so that instead of just having access to the information, instead of just relying on all of our thousands of scrapers that go to thousands of different websites each and every day, we could actually figure out who's most effective in a given issue, which member of Congress cares about something, who's most likely to actually sponsor a bill or work with someone based on how many times they've worked together in the past. A couple more examples of this. We worked with Kevin McCarthy, the majority leader in the House, to show that this Republican Congress is actually the second most effective Republican Congress of the last 40 years. And we worked with Vox to show that while bipartisanship is below the historical 40-year average, we've actually seen an uptick if we measure the times when Republicans and Democrats work together on legislation over the last six years. And finally, we worked with the New York Times this spring to, show, to look at how female members of Congress work together and show that your average female member of Congress is almost twice as likely to work across the aisle with another female member of Congress than your average male member of Congress is willing to work across the aisle with another male. Once you have the ability to access all the data and to have it all be centralized and accessible, you can actually figure out what it means and how you can use it to inform and expand your decisions. And then finally, we built all of these different tools, the data sets, the, access, the ability to search and sort and filter, the ability to find different insights and quantitative and analytic tools, and put it all into an online, easily accessible platform where not only can our users access this information and access and use these quantitative insights, but they also can access productivity tools, collaborate, collaborate in real time amongst their teams, figure out differences between two different versions of a bill, a process that used to be done by hand that took hours, or make those spreadsheets and collaborate, share them amongst your team, and do all of this with just a couple of clicks and have it auto-update and come to you directly instead of having to do all of this by hand each and every day. 
Without the power of AWS, what we've done over the last two years would not have been possible because we're a bootstrap startup. We haven't raised a single cent of outside money and are funding our 10 person, person operation completely based on revenue from companies like Toyota, GM, the United Nations uh, Population Fund and other organizations that are supporting what we're doing. Uh, and AWS gives us the power and the flexibility to gain, get the data we need, to analyze it quickly and comprehensively in real time, and then to provide these services to our clients and to do this quickly, easily, and at very low cost. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jonathan. And a tough spot right here up against Andy. So please don't forget to come to our public sector party and now run so you can go hear Andy. <laughs> Thank you.